Don't look so nervous. Good evening. We're just waiting for the last couple of people to dribble through. Um, the numbers are still going up fairly quickly. Uh, won't take too much longer. Okay. Welcome to the Sumo Masterclass series. Tonight we are discussing uh, the blockchain landscape and national perspective. I'd like to start the evening with an acknowledgement of country. I would like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we gather and pay respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community elders, past and present, who have resided in the areas we currently inhabit and who are integral part of the history of this region. We also pay our respects to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people present this evening. I'm John Morrison, I'm your MC this evening. Um, this could not be more timely given the federal budget it was only released last night and we couldn't have two better people placed to discuss tonight's subject matter, Chloe White and Steve Vallis. Chloe is the National Blockchain Lead at the Department of Industry and is responsible for driving the implementation of the Australia's first blockchain roadmap. She is also a trusted advisor on blockchain and digital assets. Previously, Chloe worked at Treasury, where she led the government's review into the initial coin offerings and advised the ASX on chess replacement and developed the department's capability in a range of financial market blockchain applications including um, through her stand, standing appointment to the Council of Financial Regulators, the DLT Working Group. And Steve is the CEO of Blockchain Australia, a qualified lawyer, digital strategist, and he's the founder of Honey, Honey Digital, who works with a range of verticals, including telecommunications, educations, and startups. He helps us at Swinburne and our, our um, little accelerator as well. Steve's focus is on building value by adding relationships with content producing professionals, social media strategists, SMEs, and, and that'd be subject matter experts, and enterprise businesses who are looking to benefit from the paradigm shift to customer centric online marketing opportunities and emerging technologies. I'm really looking forward to tonight's discussion. Steve, over to you and Chloe. Thanks, John. Uh... I am looking forward to tonight's conversation. Everyone who knows me knows that all I do is talk to people uh, all day, every day. Uh, Chloe's one of my favourite people to talk to. Uh, we never run out of things to say. And I think it's important to note before we even start talking, there's interest in this subject matter. It's incredible to me to think that, I think across a variety of sort of channels, we've had 700 people sign up for this. And I think in, in context, I know that normally it's a couple of hundred that's good. This is a very specific subject matter and we're having so much interest that's being shown. We're, we're all really, really happy to be uh, to be here. Um, as John mentioned, I'm the CEO of Blockchain Australia. We are the peak body for this conversation, the conversation about blockchain and DLT in this country. Tonight, I won't talk a lot, hopefully. You'll hear from, from Chloe. And uh, the aim here for us is to cover a lot of subject matter in a relatively short period of time. Uh, critically important, you know, what I think Chloe's going to try to do and what I'd like to try to do as well is get people to recognise there are so many people in this conversation. They all bring a very different lens to it and there are challenges and there are some things we can accommodate readily and some things that are really tough to accommodate. So hopefully by the time we push through this, uh, this hour, um, a lot of things would have been raised and happily, I'm happy to address this offline as well. Um, you know, you can come at me in a variety of social channels and we'll have this conversation uh, offline as well, but I'm going to encourage everyone to put questions into the chat um, particularly to identify yourself, I said, as we push through, you know, 300 people are online as we speak. 
put your name in there. Let us know what you do. Let us know what your project is. You know, this is an exercise in getting people to identify themselves in the ecosystem. So, you know, I want to see a bombarding scrolling message that says, here's who I am. Here's what I do. That would be, uh, that would be, uh, that would be great. So keep that going. Put questions in here. We'll, we'll get to as many as we can here tonight. And we'll also uh, come back and answer those questions that we don't, that we don't get to. Um, Chloe, I think it's important to sort of set the scene here as well, because um, you are all things blockchain for most people when it comes to the blockchain space and, and you know, the point of call it is sort of government. Can you do the scene setting? Just tell us a little bit about the, the professional bit that sort of led you into this, because I think it's important to know what lens you bring, um, you bring into this conversation. Absolutely. Thank you, Steve, for pulling this together and thank you to Swinburne for hosting the event tonight. Uh, I suppose the main angle that I bring to being the National Blockchain Roadmap lead um, is my experience as a public servant. Uh, I, I left the private sector during the GFC, uh, determined that I really wanted to make a contribution to public policy. And I've worked in government for just about nine years now. And I've worked across a range of portfolios uh, on some quite interesting and complex issues. Uh, I worked for the Rudd and Gillard governments on carbon market design. Uh, I worked then for Abbott on international climate negotiations um, and, and worked through the, the Turnbull and now Morrison governments um, on some really challenging macroeconomic issues. Um, I've done, you know, modelling on, on, on trade agreements in, in really, um, I suppose, quite um, contested issues like the, the TPP. Um, and also looked at issues like the fact that Australian households are so indebted and, and what does that mean? Uh, so you know, the things that uh, all these diverse policy issues have in common is that uh, you can't clearly point to one single person or organisation or even government department and label them as accountable. Uh, there are no really clear or simple solutions to any of those things where you would see problems or challenges in there. And so then it becomes really important to, to be able to think really clearly about Who's, who has responsibility for what aspect of the problem? What are the best solutions that you can put forward to government for solving various problems? And how do you bring together all of the diverse views and, and different stakeholder needs in, in each particular situation? And, and so that's the approach that I bring to my work now. I've been advising government on blockchain for about three years at this point. Uh, and, I, and I think um, it, is, it is an emerging technology blockchain. So it's it's not something that is very widely understood. I think people even who work in the industry full time are still really learning about blockchain, uh, what, it, what it's good for and not good for and how to use it well. So uh, that, that's, really, um, that's really my background. I suppose um, in terms of when I really started working on blockchain policy, uh, I was in the treasury for a couple of years. I'd been looking at uh, some of those big picture macro issues. Um, I was really keen to relocate to Sydney to come back home. I'd been away for about a decade uh, and I spoke to the Treasury and said, what jobs do you have going in the Sydney office? And, and the Sydney office is very much focused on financial markets. Uh, obviously, you know, in Sydney, the, the ASX is here, the big banks are here, the RBA is here. Um, and, and other CFR agencies, Council of Financial Regulator Agencies. Um, so there's a lot of financial uh, market activity in, in Sydney as a hub. And uh, at that time, the, this would have been in 20, late 2017, I think, um, ICOs, initial coin offerings, um, the issuance of, of crypto tokens, primarily for the purposes of, of business capital raising. Uh, that was something that was really quite hot at the time. And uh, th so we had um, Scott Morrison still as treasurer at this time prior, prior to the most recent election. Uh, and the treasury said, you know, we, we would like for someone to get across this issue. Uh, and, and, you know, it's come up in, in the FinTech Advisory Group which is this group that used to report to Scott Morrison when he was treasurer, now reports to Senator Hume. Um, this issue has been raised by, by FinTech Advisory Group. Can you, can you go and figure it out? And, and having spent years prior to that looking at climate change and energy markets and um, household indebtedness, I thought, oh, this sounds like the break that I need. This sounds super easy. It's, you know, magical internet money and blockchain fairy dust. And, you know, I'm just going to go to Sydney and, uh, you know, spend, spend my days reading about these crazy crypto things. Um, so I, I moved to Sydney, uh, start of 2018, and uh, started getting into uh, all this cryptocurrency stuff. Um, and then, uh, yeah, ended up working my butt off, trying to make heads or tails of everything that was going on. And you know what it's like for anyone in this, in this industry, you're, um, 
you're, you're running just to stand still in blockchain. There's so much happening every day. Uh, no one can really get across every aspect of it. So I'll do my best tonight not to use too many acronyms or, or throw too much jargon at people. But um, yeah, I would say that, uh, you know, we're all learning every day. It, it's very, it's a very, um, I think, confusing and intimidating space for people who are just getting into it. But, uh, you know, there, there's certainly a lot that I've learned and, and I continue to find it really interesting. I think it's fair to say that in almost all the rooms that I'm in as well, it's still the case that I'd categorise people as probably two out of 10 as far as their understanding of the space. So it's important, I think, you know, we've got 300 plus people online now. I think it's important to know that's where most people are. So, you know, that part of the thing of trying to demystify this is that observation. Chloe, the ICO place is the, is the best place to start. I mean, as far as most people are concerned who know the space, their formative views were determined in that ICO boom. They either thought it was the best thing ever or the greatest scam to ever, uh, to ever hit our sort of country. Do you want to give us a snapshot of what the ICO mania was, um, what some of the sort of the legacy issues are around you were involved in, uh, in developing discussion paper there, I think, for, um, uh, for Treasury? G give us the snapshot of what the ICO situation was and what the legacy of that situation is. Absolutely. We could, we could spend the entire night talking just about this issue. There's obviously a lot of history here, uh, but to try and keep it as brief as possible, um, the, the ICO boom, as we call it, peaked uh, a few years ago. And, you know, the way that I would sort of explain what happened is in, in traditional capital markets, when uh, a business is growing, wants to raise funds and is ready to issue equity in an initial public offering, uh, an IPO, then, you know, there would be a whole series of steps that they would take with whoever was their regulator um, in their jurisdiction in their jurisdiction where they would have certain disclosure documents, they would have, um, you know, licenses they would need, different financial regulations they would need to comply with. They could then go to the retail market, the general public, and issue that equity and they could then raise funds and use that to continue growing their business. I think what happened uh, in the ICO boom is a bunch of uh, experimental technologists realised that they could construct their own platforms or leverage platforms that others had constructed that were not governed by regulatory authorities and they could use these platforms to create digital tokens um, essentially uh, that, that were easily tradable and then they could sell those tokens to anyone with an internet connection essentially. And for these uh, technologists who may not necessarily have had an in-depth or, or even basic understanding of securities law, or in Australia we call them financial products, not securities, uh, then they would have gone, wow, amazing, this is, you know, a, a kind of um, removal of an intermediary or it's, you know, it's a new capital raising method. Uh, let's, um, let's bootstrap our startup by issuing these tokens and we'll use that to raise capital and then we'll go ahead and build our platform. Pretty much every ICO was different to the next one, but that's kind of the basic model or way to think about it in, in a generalist way. And initially these initial coin offerings where the coins were these cryptographic tokens, these ICOs uh, took place within a fairly niche and fairly technical community. So these technologists may not have been literate in financial product law, but they were certainly literate in you know, the cryptocurrency world or um, you know, this kind of nascent blockchain technology. And they were largely marketing to each other. But this trend grew to the point where these tokens were being marketed to everyday people, you know, on social media and that type of thing. Um, and billions of dollars were pouring into these token markets. Um, at one point, the amount of money going into ICOs actually exceeded the amount of money that was raised by venture capital. So it was really quite phenomenal and it was, it was a global event um, and, and Australia was part of that as well in the sense that uh, there were Australians who were issuing these tokens and, and there were tokens being marketed to Australians as well. Um, I think that once it kind of crossed that threshold where it was no longer just this niche community of people, it was being marketed to the masses, um, that's when we saw the regulators step in and say, hang on a second, what you're issuing here seems to resemble a financial product. And if you are selling financial products to the public, you actually need to be licensed. And just because you issue it on a blockchain doesn't mean that you are excluded from following the law. So... Then there were some notices issued. Some people um, did not proceed with the ICO. I've heard of some examples where um, money was actually refunded to, to the investors. But uh, I think the confusion arose where uh, people then said, well, hang on a second. 
I'm not issuing pure equity, my token uh, serves all these other functions. And uh, we have this concept of a utility token where uh, you could use the token uh, to, to leverage the platform that would eventually be designed. And, uh, and, and so I think, you know, there were some people in the community who had a view that said, um, I define my token this way. So, you know, therefore the law does not apply to me. And I don't think that um, regulators have found that to be very satisfying. And certainly uh, if we look at the actions that regulators worldwide have taken, particularly the SEC in, in the United States, uh, that there, there continues to be um, a clear message that if you are going to raise capital and you want to raise that capital from the general public, you need to have the appropriate licensing. Um, so, so some of the argument that came forward then was, well, this is an innovative new uh, method of fundraising. Look at the billions of dollars that have been poured into it. Uh, why don't we amend our regulatory regime so that we can capture a slice of that pie? Um, and essentially proposing that we should have a, uh, a sort of bespoke regime that, that implies that if you are raising capital through this innovative new blockchain method, uh, you would have your own set of rules that would apply to you. Uh, that is a a challenging proposition from a policy perspective in a country like Australia, where our laws generally are, are principles based and also technology neutral. So what that means is that uh, if you want to, um, if you want to make sure that the market is neutral, so that you're not uh, creating perverse incentives for the market to use one type of technology over another or, or to conduct one type of activity over another. You wouldn't want to structure regulations in a way that would push the market down a particular path that they otherwise wouldn't go themselves. So if we had one regime that, that said, well, if you're issuing equity, but you're doing it on a blockchain, uh, you don't have to go through all the normal licensing that you would in an IPO, then we could expect that what might happen there is that a lot of uh, companies that would have otherwise done an IPO would instead do an ICO and, and is that something that's actually really desirable? And then people get down uh, a path where they say, well, um, then you'll just have to vet to make sure the project actually needs a token. And it's, it's getting way too prescriptive of that, at that point. We're moving really far away from the principles-based regime. Um, and so I think that, uh, you know, what the regulators have tried to do is to say, is it complicated and confusing to try and raise capital or to issue financial products? Yes, absolutely. What can we as regulators do? We can update our guidance, try to make our guidance as clear as possible. So the, the main regulator that's relevant in this case in Australia is the Australian Securities and Investments Commission, ASIC. And ASIC has an innovation hub uh, where, you, where you can go and inquire and they, they have helped so many companies and given out uh, lots of guidance um, formally on their website um, and, and also to, to businesses who've inquired through this hub. So that's been the response. But I think it's also worth acknowledging when this debate comes up that says, well, don't we want to capture a slice of this pie? Look at all the money that we could be grabbing. It's one thing to look at all the money that was raised in the ICO boom. But equally, we need to acknowledge all of the capital that was destroyed in that boom as well. Uh, we know that most of the cryptocurrency projects that arose in that boom failed. Many of them were outright scams. Uh, and for the projects that are still around, uh, the mania that followed that boom resulted in such extraordinary valuations for some of those tokens. It seems very unlikely to me that most of those tokens will ever return to their all-time highs. And so huge amounts of capital were destroyed in the ICO boom. And I think that, that that often goes unacknowledged in this discussion about capturing a slice of the pie. But it is important because the money that was raised came from somewhere. It came from people's savings accounts. It came from other parts of the economy. It didn't appear out of thin air. So I think we need to be really mindful of the fact that the reason why Australia gets to enjoy its reputation as a place that has strong financial markets and is a, a global financial hub and, and has market integrity is that we haven't compromised on our financial product regime. And that doesn't mean there aren't things we could do to simplify the law or clarify the law. And even in ASIC's submission to the ICO review, which you can find on the Treasury's website, ASIC themselves acknowledge that there are parts of the law that could be improved, uh, particularly with regard to, to tech neutrality, that, that principle that I mentioned before. But I think uh, that ultimately, I know, I know that there are people on this call who 
have bought and sold these tokens or even issued these tokens, there are also people on this call who've campaigned against these tokens and this trend. Um, we need to remember that, you know, that this regulatory regime does exist for a reason. Um, and we need to approach change with a lot of caution where that change is in the direction of uh, essentially reducing consumer protection. Protection, protection for consumers and for investors. I think it's important, Chloe, that the, the rally, the regulation, I've always said to people, the, the, the lament is it's not moving fast enough. I think the lament will surely be, you know, shortly be, and um, we don't like where it decided to, uh, to sort of stop. I mean, there's a lot of movement in the EU at the moment. There's a lot of guidelines that are coming in the EU. There's lots of movements and guidance that comes from the Financial Action Task Force. I think the next complaint is we don't like the rules. So on the one part, I know that on the one hand, this is one of the challenges where it's sort of a fraught discussion. I think we find ourselves in a position where people say we want certainty and soon they'll complain about the certainty because they don't like where the certainty ultimately is. And that, that's one of the challenges for us, I think, you know, from an association perspective, and a government perspective, when we're talking to businesses, you know, I will often frame to them, what's your view? And then just say, you're a long distance from where the regulations are. So that can remain your view, but that might mean that the implication is the jurisdiction is the wrong jurisdiction for you. So it's a conversation with you know, a few people I've seen in the feed. They're right. There is glacial movement in relation to regulation. And there is, because the reality is as soon as someone loses money, that noise outweighs the quick move that says the dollars are coming. So I know it's a conversation we can talk about the forever and a day. Your, your quick view on what, what is government's role then, Chloe? I mean, your government's role with respect to you know, blockchain technology, because again, two views. One is government should lead and government should budget it. And the other view is stay the hell away from what we're doing. So you know, how are you perceiving the, uh, the view of uh, you know, what government should be doing in this space? Absolutely. So uh, I'd like to actually quote um, the, the minister who, who owns the roadmap, Minister Karen Andrews. Uh, so she wrote an opinion piece in the Australian Financial Review just last month, uh, where she was talking about the digital economy and, and technology. And uh, she said, Australia's digital and tech future will not be a product of big government. Agile, innovative, productive businesses are the key to our prosperity, not big government which is by nature slow moving and bureaucratic. She said, that is not to say government doesn't have a role, but its role is to facilitate access to technology and to provide support for the science our critical industry sectors need to keep growing. She said, we need to especially be a facilitator for our small and medium enterprises that need both access and awareness of how technology can help grow their business. And I think that's a really important quote from the minister and, and the approach that she has taken to blockchain is the same as the approach that she's taken to AI and elsewhere in her portfolio, which the theme to me there, what I read there is it's really about lowering barriers to entry so that markets can solve problems, not bureaucrats. Um, we don't... Sorry, Chloe, I was sorry to interrupt. I think one of the challenges, again, that people sort of, and this is a conversation I have often, state-based challenges that relate to federal priorities as well. That, that intersection is a really challenging environment because I know states will do things that suit states. And I know when I have conversations about something like a startup ecosystem, and I've just seen some comments about the startup ecosystem, those conversations are normally state-based conversations. There is no uniform policy that drives startup, startups at a national sort of a level. So they, they, are, they are sort of conversations that sort of intersect a lot. With respect to the roadmap uh, now, so move on to the conversation of the roadmap. I was involved a little bit at the, at the consultation side. Last year, there was enthusiasm about it. Um, I think ultimately it got dropped in February. You know, the, there, was a, there was views expressed about good, bad or indifferent. You, you came into this primary role near the February sort of estate. Do you, give me the landscape view that says, what is the roadmap, you know, first instance? What is the roadmap? What, is it, what does it sort of seek to do? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the blockchain roadmap is essentially, uh, it, it's based on a, a dozen different signposts. So you can think of the signposts as action items. And those action items are quite broad and diverse. So they relate to a lot of the challenges we see across emerging technology. So uh, challenges around skills, challenges around investment, uh, access to, to infrastructure, um, government facing signposts as well around, uh, you know, uh, making sure that um, government has the information and capabilities that it needs. Um, there, are, there are issues around blockchain literacy and general awareness around blockchain, which we've talked about a little bit. Um, the, the crown jewels of the roadmap are the, the use cases, which essentially try to illustrate in more practical terms, what are some sectors or uh, business activities where blockchain might be able to uh, lend some sort of benefit. And so uh, the, the architecture that we've been constructing under the roadmap um, in recent months has been to establish, uh, I suppose what you could call um, 
public-private uh, collaborations or working groups where we bring together people from all the government and non-government sectors to identify what are the opportunities that do exist in economic terms? So how does blockchain actually deliver you some kind of efficiency gain or, or other improvement that is, you know, better than using some traditional kind of technology? And to the extent that that opportunity does exist and, and we can identify and label it, what are the barriers that exist to leveraging that opportunity? And if those barriers are the fault of, of regulation, uh, then let's make sure we can feed that message back to the people who need to hear it on the government side so that we can, again, coming back to this idea from, from the minister about lowering barriers to entry, that essentially we make sure that what the government's doing is playing that facilitative role where one of, one of the most primary, uh, primarily important things that I think government can do is to just step out of the way of the market make sure that there is that opportunity, particularly for small and medium enterprises, which is uh, what drives a lot of growth in the real economy uh, so that they can make the decisions that they need to without having um, too much uncertainty um, or, you know, laws that are not tech neutral or that kind of thing. So uh, outline for me then quite the use cases for those that don't know, there were three nominated at first instance and now there've been sort of two, two additions. Do you want to run through what the use cases are as, as identified in the roadmap? That's right. So um, the first use case that was featured in the roadmap was um, in the agricultural sector and it relates to supply chains. Um, so one very popular application that gets talked about a lot there is the idea of food provenance that you can essentially track and trace some kind of agricultural product. And uh, the reason why that comes up so often is because there, there are big issues with um, fraud and counterfeiting of the Australian brand in international markets where our food does tend to attract a premium. And, and so that's a problem that the agricultural industry has been working on for quite some time. And there have been blockchain suppliers that have stepped forward to, to offer to be a part of that solution. Uh, the second use case is in the education sector, which is another one of our really strong export sectors uh, and, and growth areas. So um, the idea there is that um, there, there are quite high rates of fraud when it comes to uh, education credentials, people pretending that they have obtained a particular qualification um, or to a certain level. And so the, the, that use case is really about credentialing and saying, well, how can you verify a document um, or verify the issuer of a document or, or something of that nature and, and reduce that kind of um, document fraud. And then the third use case um, was a, a hypothetical use case in the financial markets, which was really focused on how could uh, financial institutions share data with each other about their customers in a way that uh, would basically bring them some kind of uh, regulatory compliance efficiency gain so that they could comply with, uh, with know your customer obligations, which, which they have to, to Austrac. Um, and, uh, you know, if blockchain could help with that problem, um, then that's something that could potentially be explored. So those were the three use cases in the published version of the roadmap, which, as you say, was released just prior to COVID earlier this year. Um, the working groups that we've set up uh, are those private public uh, collaborative groups that I mentioned. Uh, there are two of them that are already up and running and there are two of them that uh, have, have been announced and the memberships are forming at the moment. So uh, the first two are on those first two use cases. So um, supply chains in agriculture and credentialing in education. Um, the, the two additional use cases uh, were determined um, by the National Blockchain Roadmap Steering Committee, which um, is chaired by the Department of Industry, but it, it primarily consists of, uh, you know, private sector participants and, uh, and academics. And essentially, uh, those two use cases um, are really designed to make sure that the strategic priorities that we pursue under the roadmap are consistent with the post-COVID priorities of the government. So one of them is on deregulation. And that is something that Scott Morrison uh, has, has emphasised as being even more important um, post-COVID. So he made that announcement that he was bringing the deregulatory task force uh, into his own portfolio and, and he's clearly got a big emphasis on making life easier for business. So there is a working group on deregulation being established and that is essentially around, you know, can blockchain be a facilitative technology for reg tech solutions? And then there's also cyber security. So we know that cyber threats have been increasing this year. Uh, and now that everyone's doing everything in a virtual world more than ever before, um, cyber security is even more important than it ever was before. And if blockchain can be an enabling technology uh, for cyber security, then, then that's something worth looking at as well. So they are, they are the four working groups that have been established um, 
for, for the start of the working group, uh, for, the, for the roadmap working groups. And we expect that there'll be more working groups that would be established over the five years of the roadmap's life. So I'm going to ask you a lot of questions now, one after the other. And this is the bit we start churning through a lot of the questions. So that foundation that you've set that says, here's the history. And the history has created, I think it's fair to say, from my perspective, a degree of trepidation. And I, and I see, actually see that trepidation in, in business. I mean, I know the criticism is often government, but I, I don't see a lot of industry players, businesses that should be investing in this tech. In fact, I, I saw them do this a while back. They crossed the arms, they sat back, and they're not revisiting it. So I think pressure needs to be brought to bear on, on industry as well. I'm going to run through a series of questions and I'm curious as to what the sort of the, the response is because these are things I hear all day every day from community members. Why was there no money on the roadmap? Was it a good decision not to provide money? And I know I saw I read something recently that said what a monumental waste of money. So even when there, there is no money, which is a spoiler, people are saying what a waste it is to do this. Well, tell me the money situation. The roadmap was released. There was no obvious funding that was provided. Yeah, so again, this is very consistent uh, with, with how the Minister prefers to manage her portfolio. She has said publicly um, that, you know, she, she generally doesn't believe that you just throw money at a problem. That's, that's not the, the principle from which she likes to, to perform her role. Um, and if you look at the reaction that, that uh, we saw in the, in the media and, and from industry and artificial intelligence late last year, there were a lot of um, people who were expressing concern that, um, you know, the government hadn't put sufficient funding behind the AI work. That, that came out then. Um, you know, it's the same thing with blockchain. The, the minister's approach is it's an incremental process. Um, so although the government didn't directly carve out money that was specifically attached to the roadmap um, on launch of the roadmap, um, first of all, it's not correct to say the government hasn't provided any funding for blockchain. Um, there've been multiple expenditures. Um, and essentially, you know, you want the government to work in partnership with the private sector and listen to what the private sector is saying and let the markets lead the way. It's not all just about spending money. Uh, so you can see that we, we do take a very collaborative approach with industry and academia. Um, they make up the bulk of representatives on our steering committee, on all of our working groups. Um, it, it's a very close uh, relationship. Um, that's how it works in AI. That's how it works in blockchain. So the decisions that were taken, you know, they've, they've been totally consistent with the approach of a minister who says, uh, you know, that, it's, it's good to actually identify what are the problems and what are the appropriate solutions to those problems. And the appropriate solution is not always going to be money straight up. Um, you know, having said all of that, uh, obviously the, the budget announcement uh, has got a lot of people quite animated, as you say, um, in, in many different directions. So um, the, the 6.9 million that was allocated uh, for two blockchain pilots in the budget, I think it signals that, uh, you know, the government's investment in blockchain is strengthening over time. We can see that this is the biggest investment that they've made um, in, in different blockchain expenditures that they've made. It's not the first time they've allocated budget funds to blockchain. Uh, for, there's been that NDIS pilot, for example, National Disability Insurance Scheme pilot, which you can read about on the Digital Transformation Agency's website. Um, also, the government has funded Standards Australia with a co-contribution model with the non-government sector, um, and that, that's positioned Australia as a recognisable leader on the world stage when it comes to the, the body of work that's, that's coming under the ISO umbrella. Um, so that overall direction is um, that, that confidence appears to be growing, um, but not all signals are financial. Um, you know, the launch of the roadmap this year, as as much as some people might have thought, hang on, where's the money? Um, the signaling effect of that is, is meaningful on its own. So I think uh, taking everything in context, you know, and coming back to this year's budget, um, the government's focus right now is clearly on jobs and economic recovery. Um, the the 6.9 million that's been allocated for these pilots is part of a broader package called the Job Maker Digital Business Plan. Um, and if you saw the Prime Minister's media release, it's actually titled the Digital Business Plan to Drive Australia's Economic Recovery. So the context for these blockchain pilots are they're part of an $800 million economic recovery package. $800 million is quite a sum of money. The, the 6.9 million would be less than 1% of that package. And that $800 million package itself is less than 1% of, of the budget deficit that we're looking at. So we're talking about, you know, a fraction of, of a fraction. Um, so in the context of the budget, you know, blockchain is not the, the front page news article. Um, and some people have said, you know, is $6.9 million enough? You know, we've waited quite a while for this money and, you know, we're not really sure 
if, if this was the best that you could do. Um, but coming back again to this idea that what we're really interested in is not just money, but actually solutions. Uh, on the other hand, some people have said, hang on, isn't $6.9 million quite a lot of money for two pilots? What are these pilots going to do? Um, and that is quite a, um, quite a significant sum of money when you think about two pilots. So, um, you know, thinking about the whole context of this budget and what this budget is intended to achieve, which is really about economic stimulus, um, we would like these blockchain pilots to really model something that is unique and that also uh, needs to be rolled out really quickly um, because ultimately this digital business package, it being an economic recovery package, um, is, is quite a short term uh, activity. So, you know, essentially we're looking at a few different KPIs here. We're looking at, um, you know, delivering bona fide results uh, for the deregulation agenda. This money is tied to the idea that we want to make life easier for business. So deregulation is a big theme. Um, we want this to be an educational exercise for multiple stakeholder groups. Um, we want actual regulators involved. We want different industries involved. We want the blockchain sector involved, obviously, um, and we want to boost block blockchain literacy across different sectors of the economy. Uh, so we want these to be flagship projects that support the strategic objectives of the National Blockchain Roadmap Steering Committee. Um, and so it hits on quite a few different KPIs and they've all got to be achieved in a really short period of time. Um, so it, it's actually quite ambitious um, and, and that's why the sum of money has come out as it has. Um, I suppose at the end of the day, if you've got... Um, people criticizing you on too big and too small, then maybe you, you have struck the right middle ground. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it, 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 it helps if you think about, you know, what is the broader context here? And I think for this government at this time, the context is very much about economic stimulus and creating jobs. I think and, and the, the pressure as well, as, as you're talking, Claire, I'm seeing a lot of conversation in the chat about startups. And my, my call is to put pressure on startup community leaders. Because this is what frustrates the absolute crap out of me. You know, when I talk to people about, tell me, talk to me about blockchain DLT in a broad sense. Tell me what startup ecosystem is supporting this. And people can't point me to Australian startup ecosystem. I can see the startups who are trying. I actually don't see the people that are leading these conversations in a state-based way saying, let's bring together these ideas. You know, I did something with Austrade uh, this week. You know, we, we asked uh, for some people to nominate for a boot camp that we're doing out of Israel with Austrade. It was hard work to find them. And, and the reality is that we need to shake the people who are in charge of these sort of startup ecosystems. In the end, we found 70 businesses that put their hand up to be interested in it. So important on this call out, someone asked just then as well, how many people are on the Zoom? 330 people are on the Zoom right now. If you know startups, get them to message me. You know, send me the details, send me the website. Let me, let me know where they're at in their journey because the startup conversation is not homogenous. My challenge here is if you're at ideation stage, you need certain support. If you are at MVP stage, you need certain support. If you're at scale up stage. So let's put pressure on. I think this is the thing for me is just draw that, uh, draw that out. Chloe, th that's the general sort of snapshot. Again, now we've talked about uh, the roadmap. We've talked about this money. What it is and what it isn't. You know, my read as well is I know it's going to get spent quickly. I think the nature of all the budget stuff I saw last night says there's money coming. And there are going to be lots of people, I think, in every conversation have, are unhappy about where it goes ultimately. And I think that's something we can address. But I, my, my call out again is let's make the claim for money as compelling as we possibly can. So I think that's the opportunity we have as a, as a blockchain space. Um, we're going to run through stuff quickly now that this thing getting faster. Sorry, Chloe. Um, the blockchain side, there's still enormous confusion. Tell me just very quickly, blockchain, narrow definition, blockchain, DLT, broad definition. Because if you're in the narrow view, you tend not to want to talk to people on the board. You just distinguish for me those two things. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I think that um, for me, what captures this really well is uh, just this week, I was reading an article uh, where there was a, a blockchain skeptic um, from the cybersecurity community who was saying, oh, blockchain's terrible. We hate blockchain. You would never want to use blockchain. Um, what you really need is some kind of database where every file is individually encrypted. So no two files are the same. And uh, you need to use public private key infrastructure. Um, and you need a multi signature custody set up. And, uh, and, you know, also the ledger needs to have everything time stamped and date stamped. And I thought, 
Okay, so what you're telling me is that um, you would never use blockchain, but you would definitely use blockchain. Um, and I think it really just comes down to your definition of, you know, what, what, is, what is this technology that we're talking about? And, um, you know, for the purposes of the roadmap, we take as, as broad a view as possible or as broad a definition as possible. I think um, one sort of narrow way to think about it is in that kind of, uh, you know, public infrastructure sense that says, if you've got something that's um, totally decentralized and totally permissionless, um, and yeah, uses this kind of public key infrastructure, then, uh, you know, that's, that's going to resemble more of, of what we understand as a blockchain. And on the other hand, if you've got something that is um, private and permissioned, uh, you know, or, um, or, or not that kind of classic um, Bitcoin style arrangement, then, uh, you know, it's, it's not a blockchain, it's something else. Um, is there a difference between blockchain and DLT, distributed ledger technology? Um, I think the reason why, you know, we take a, a kind of broad definition under the, under the roadmap is for that reason that I said before around, um, you know, perverse incentives. Uh, if, there's, if there's a market solution out there that dictates that, um, actually, the best governance arrangement for a consortium is that they, they do want to remove some single points of failure or weaknesses in their system, and they do want to use cryptography, and they do want to, do want to use multi-signature, they want to have some kind of way of sharing that data. They may not um, have such an intense level of distrust that they want to outsource consensus to some kind of um, proof-of-work public blockchain um you know like a nakamoto consensus but but then oh, oh you're geeking out this is the point you're geeking out you know they, they, you, you love this stuff the, the next question you go this is some of the thing at extremes is bitcoin legal some people don't think bitcoin's legal is bitcoin legal this is again these these are the myths we're moving to myth busting now is bitcoin legal yeah B bitcoin is is fantastic bitcoin is definitely legal um so i look i think um I heard um, on a podcast the other day, someone referred to Bitcoin as a boomer coin. And I just thought that was fantastic um, because, you know, Bitcoin is boring in all of the right ways, in all of the ways that you want a cryptocurrency to be boring. Um, it's been around at least twice as long as most of, of the others in circulation. And, and I think, uh, you know, it's important to note as well, uh, Bitcoin's base protocol is 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 ossifying at the moment um, unlike some of the other major known cryptocurrencies that are still planning huge structural adjustments um, and that ossification of the base layer I think um, brings comfort to investors because they can understand uh, you know really that the, how the system looks now is more or less how the system is going to look for a, for a long time and the main thing that I would say about Bitcoin to people in this call tonight is if you have if you're in blockchain or have any interest in this space um, and you don't study Bitcoin carefully, then you are really missing out and doing yourself a huge disservice. Um, it's totally wrong to think that this is the MySpace of crypto and all of those kind of takes. Um, if you haven't had the experience of transacting value peer to peer, uh, and having that value transfer validated by your own node, um, you are missing out on a really exciting and actually quite profound experience. Um, you know, what we're really talking about with Bitcoin is a historical breakthrough in computer science. And I think you can't appreciate it in its entirety just from a theoretical point of view. You need to have a practical appreciation of it. And I know it can seem intimidating when I'm talking about, you know, spinning up a node and peer-to-peer and -peer transaction and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, my advice is to, to start with the Bitcoin blockchain because it really is the most accessible and, and it's quite a bit simpler than a lot of the other cryptocurrencies. Um, it, there's so much free information available on the internet about how to get these things done. Um, there are so many people who would be willing to assist you. I would say, um, you know, some, some local resources would be uh, look up Ministry of Nodes. Um, they really specialise in getting people set up and running on Bitcoin nodes. And you can basically make a donation to them um, in, in return for their time and advice. But they also have a lot of free content on the YouTube. Um, you could look at resources like the Stefan Levera podcast, which which is quite a technical podcast where there are, there are episodes coming out all the time around um, recent developments in options for how to set up a node. And I think some of the developments in, in Bitcoin node usability and, and, and consumer friendliness, even just in 2020, will knock your socks off if you haven't looked at it this year. So go and visit it again if you looked at nodes in the past and thought that they were too complicated. Um, or even going to public meetups. I think pretty much every Australian capital has its own local Bitcoin meetup. Um, for if you're based in Sydney, um, where I am, you can go to bitcoinsydney.org and there'll be a lot of information there. Um, that group meets um, a couple of times a month and, and, you know, no one is more friendly than a Bitcoiner talking about 
you know, Bitcoin nodes to, to newbies. So just show up. I'm, I'm basically part of the furniture at that meetup. So you'll see me there um, and, and try and get your hands dirty with this tech. Use the tech because I think that's where the learning really starts to get quite exciting. All right, you've got 15 seconds for each one of these now. Now that you're juiced up because you're a Bitcoin maxi and those that are on the call will know that you love, you love this and you're probably sitting surrounded by nodes in the house. Um, <laughs> blockchain, a hammer looking for a nail. Give me the 10 second response to blockchain, a hammer looking for the nail. It comes up in every conversation. Yeah, so I think um, that's quite understandable because of all the hype that we saw, particularly a few years back. I think, you know, the reality is that every different blockchain protocol has its own set of trade-offs. And at this point in the cycle, it's really important for us to all be honest with ourselves, each other and, and onlookers about what those trade-offs and weaknesses are. Otherwise, trust can never be earned back. Uh, blockchain doesn't scale, Chloe, apparently. doesn't scale. Yeah, so one way to flip that question around would be to say, if you think that, you know, transaction costs are too high on a protocol for your use case, is your use case actually generating enough value to incentivize miners or maintainers of the network to actually do the work, like do the proof of work um, to deliver on, on your transaction? So, you know, you've these this infrastructure um, is, is very fit for purpose and you've got to make sure that you're using it in a sensible way. So I would say it's not necessarily the protocols that are the problem. It might be the way that you're using them. Um, who needs blockchain because Visa and MasterCard can process 50,000 transactions a second? That's a great point. Um, so, you know, are we using um, blockchains for... Uh, to compete with, with Visa and MasterCard because that might not be such a smart idea, um, particularly in an Australian context where we have infrastructure like the new payments platform. Um, but I think, you know, coming back to this idea of, of Bitcoin as well being something that's quite understood, you know, um, Bitcoin is, is great if you, if you don't want to transact very often and you want to actually just store value and not move that value around too, too much. Um, you know, a lot of Bitcoin's benefits uh, are the same as gold. A lot, you know, some of its weaknesses are the same as gold as well. We don't think that gold sucks because we can't use it to buy coffee. Um, you know, so again, we've got to think about what is, what is actually the intention behind these projects? What are we actually trying to achieve? Now, where's the killer app, Chloe? Apparently, there has to be a killer app. There's no killer app. This is all a bullshit space because I haven't seen the app. What's the response? Yeah, I, I, I think that that is the, the wrong question to ask. You know, we don't, we don't ask um, what is the killer app, um, you know, of HTTP. Like, this is, this is a protocol or an infrastructure. Um, each, uh, each competing protocol will have its own set of trade-offs again. So I think it's just about understanding, you know, what, what these infrastructures can and can't do and then being able to relate, uh, relate that to your own needs. That was a lot of questions in a short period of time there, Chloe. The, 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 I know the subject matter that we sort of laid out, there's lots of them. There's questions here. There's a dozen questions. It's, I haven't gone through them yet, so it'll be a bit of potluck for you to, to answer or not answer. I sort of recognise that I'm no doubt happy to um, chime in as well. Uh, I think we've covered a lot of territory. I guess the summary for me here is it is a complicated space. I know that depending on where you look at it, you see part of it. And you might not like what you see. I guess one of the challenges, and you know, this is social channels and the rooms I find myself in in general, it's easy to actually criticise this space. Absolutely, you know, particularly if you have one view. And I think the tough thing at the moment is uh, committing the time, committing the energy. The thing I know about this community is almost all the people I know in this community have done this for no money. They've done it for no money over a long period of time. There's real passion associated sort of with it. So on the one side, when people tell me about you know scammers and they get, they're actually such a small they're not people I deal with. If you're a scammer, generally people don't associate with scammers. You know, we're dealing with people who love this space and I think are trying to try to move this space. I'll jump into the questions. So if there are any other questions we're going to push through, it is, uh, we've got 10 minutes left, or a little bit less than 10 minutes left. This is 50 minutes on the summary sort of version. Um, interested in knowing the credentialing use case and the government's plan, the roadmap to enable these use cases, what challenges and opportunities do you see and what's the best approach for rollout? Now, mindful that we're going to churn through a few questions, Chloe. It's on the credentialing thing. It's a broad subject matter. What do you sort of, uh, you know, what are the obvious things that pop out for you from that question? Yeah. So, so again, I think consistent with with everything I've tried to to say tonight, it's not up to the government to decide. The reason we have the credentialing working group is because we want to bring together all the people who are interested in blockchain for credentials, and have them report 
what is the opportunity or what are the what are the most useful opportunities and what are the barriers that are standing in the way where government can facilitate that ease of entry so if there are regulatory barriers you know the deregulatory task force at pmc we are working closely with them they are on standby for us to feed that information back to them we can feed it back to whoever are the relevant regulators or government agencies um, you know in the case where we are not the agency who actually is responsible uh, for, for those issues so um, you know, that it's, it's, it's really, I think, important to remember that what the government is doing here is not saying, uh, let's all use blockchain for everything, or even let's, uh, let's use blockchain um, for one particular reason. It's to say, hey, experts, you know, industry and academics, um, you want, you are telling us that you want to use this technology. Um, tell us what we need to do to facilitate that from a government point of view. Uh, Gaurav says, uh uh, do you see a point where we would move towards data self-sovereignty, consumer having control over their data for applications such as KYC of healthcare records? I think in a very long term, then potentially. Um, I, I think that for people who are in this space, uh, we can see that potential, but it's important to remember that, um, you know, the, the technical literacy that's required to be able to self-custody data packets is, is actually not a joke um, and although the user experience is improving quite rapidly over time uh, it's still it's still a, a quite a risky and demanding venture so uh, I would say that you know it's probably not something we're likely to see anytime soon but uh, you know anything is possible in this space. Uh, what's the timeline to deliver these two pilots has there been any um, any information provided yet about what that timeline looks like? The first pilot will be delivered next year um, so it'll, it'll start and finish before the end of next year. Um, the second pilot will start uh, either um, late next year um, or early the year after, but uh, the, the money has been allocated out to 2022. Um, so the, the bulk of the work will be done um, in the next 18 months. And the pilot, the question here from Harrison, are the, are the pilots, uh, paraphrasing, are the pilots subject matter been determined yet or is that TBC as far as what the, what these particular pilots will pertain to? So we're working uh, on this uh, at the moment and we're hoping to be able to provide some more information very soon, obviously, because, um, you know, these are on quite short time frames as well. Um, so once those guidelines have been developed, we'll be able to share more of that. Uh, to paraphrase, John Pratt's written here, I'll paraphrase it first, but he says, why do you think, uh, given how long ago, saying in 1991 there were research papers discussing this sort of, this sort of uh, technology, why do you think it's still looking for a viable commercial application beyond Bitcoin um, many, many years, 29 years later? Yeah, I think that as the technology has changed, um, people's uh, desire to want to use it has changed um, and the understanding is just evolving all the time. And, and one thing that, uh, that I think about is, 20 years after the internet was invented, there were still quite vocal critics around saying, well, this has been a total failure. The internet's completely failed to live up to its hype. It hasn't delivered on its promise. It's been around for two decades now. And, you know, this, so this would be in, you know, 1990, um, you know, we by now should be living in a world where, um, you know, we're having like virtual meetings and information on any issue is at your fingertips. And of course, in 1990, we didn't have Zoom or Wikipedia or all these kind of things. Um, and we can now look back and clearly see that the internet was totally revolutionary. Um, you know, so, so I think blockchain is still very young. It's only been worked on in a serious way for about five years, which is barely anything. Um, and I think that, you know, because, uh, the technology itself is still so nascent. Um, you know, people call it an emerging technology. I personally think of it as an experimental technology. I just think it is so new and that we just don't really understand enough about it yet um, to be able to make a definitive call either way. Um, is this like another layer of the internet that's going to be really revolutionary and, and, and upend everything? Um, you know, I think that the, the jury really is still out and this, this needs some more time to play out. I'd love to have a conversation with John Pratt about it because I've got a simpler answer, Chloe, and the answer is people. But people and organisations, you know, people do things a particular way, they're invested in a particular way. It's, it's very hard to get change. You know, I often joke with people when they talk about change managers within organisations, uh, the vast majority of people are don't change managers. They're in there, they like what they're doing. It's very hard to get that across the line. But uh, uh, 
a, a conversation for another day with John. Uh, Anson Zeal out of Singapore. Anson sort of said to build jobs in Australia is the government's goal. With opportunities offered by blockchain, how does the Australian government propose to build confidence for utilising blockchain? Can Australia use that to seize opportunities in the Asia Pacific region? And uh, I'd like to talk to Anson more. We sit on a panel together with the DAXA, which is dealing with issues around uh, FATF and the travel rules. So, is that conversation into Singapore as well, sort of, Chloe? You know, how, how, do, we, how do we build confidence with respect to this conversation? Yeah, so we actually have a couple of signposts in the roadmap that are internationally facing and, and we work closely with um, Austrade, for example. Uh, so certainly we want to make sure that the things that we are doing uh, are not only inward looking, but that also tell a story that would make Australia an attractive destination for investment and, and for talent as well. Um, so that is definitely something that we are having conversations about in the course of our work, um, you know, but very obviously as well, I think the fact that uh, in this budget, the government has decided to fund two blockchain pilots um, and that these will be, uh, yeah, signature projects that really model, uh, you know, what, in what way can blockchain uh, reduce costs for businesses? Um, and do it in a way that, uh, you know, has a clear value add, I think, um, beyond other technology is really what, what we hope to achieve from that. So hopefully that will be uh, something that, that is quite educational and, and puts the right signal out there. Uh, Mark Cox asked a question I think I'll probably answer. Any work on coordinating cross-border identity and payments with New Zealand? I'm talking to New Zealand, spoke to them yesterday with their blockchain association. I think the truth is most countries are doing their own thing and not necessarily sort of cross-border a lot. So I don't know if you have any comment, but Chloe, if I'm, I'm engaging with blockchain association in New Zealand as well. So I would like much more of this conversation to be going backwards and uh, backwards and forwards. Um, is it too early to view blockchain as a viable technology for small to medium businesses? That's what Jamie asks. Well, I mean, not necessarily. Again, it sort of comes back to, um, you know, can you be clear about what exactly is the pressure point? You know, where's the friction? What's the problem that you want to solve in your business? Um, and then, you know, there are any range of blockchain suppliers out there that, that may be able to assist you, but uh, we have to judge each, each use case on its merits. Um, and I think that there is no uh, one size fits all. I certainly wouldn't want to make a generalization that says that blockchain is only for enterprise. Uh, Arthur asks, will Australian government replace cash with national cryptocurrency like China is doing? My answer is, Arthur, no, not anytime soon. I think the RBA came out the other day and said there's no demand that they can see that warrants uh, a shift towards a retail from a central bank digital currency, but they're investigating. So at the moment, uh, I think some other nations are moving much faster than that. So I think we'll take our cue from uh, from those we trust who are doing that sort of, uh, that sort of thing. Um, uh, Stephen says, is there an application of blockchain you've come across that made you laugh out loud. I saw an ICF for bananas once, Chloe. I think it was banana coin. I think if you Google banana coin, they, they were building factories. I actually thought it was a good ICO. They were going to take banana money, pay you in bananas and build a factory. But have you seen any that, uh, that stick out in your mind as being particularly entertaining? I think I've actually um, blocked them from my brain. Uh, you know, there, there are hilarious uh, use cases that come up all the time. Uh, but, you know, the one that I think really made me shake my head recently was, was dental coin which was a, a cryptocurrency just for dentists. Um, and, it, you know, to me, I think it illustrates one of the misunderstandings that, uh, you know, people who don't have a lot of economics training fall into this trap in this space where they say, well, you know, we're going to have a, a currency, our own currency for our project. And, you know, if you multiply that across thousands of projects, what you're really asking the public to do is to hold so many exchange rates in their mind that anytime they want to use your, you know, utility token or whatever, um, they've got to do all of these conversions. And that, that really distorts price discovery in an economy. It's actually not a very efficient model. Um, you know, some, some goods or, or markets in the economy are natural monopolies or oligopolies. And I think money or currency has got to be one of those where it just really doesn't make sense for there to be so many different currencies that, you know, it, it, it all becomes a little bit meaningless after a while. So to me, that's not really tenable. Uh, there, I'm happy to say there are lots of questions we haven't answered, Chloe, so we're going to have to come back to them. I'm going to get you to answer them as well when we catch up. Uh, final one that's come through uh, from Frank, I think, at Playtime Solutions. He said there are so many protocols to choose from. And um, what are your thoughts in terms of uh, uptake? As in, the, it, it's the, the choice is enormous. How do people sort of choose? What, it, what, what sort of just some quick thoughts on that? Yeah, look, I think my first thing I would say is learn slowly, um, you know, come into the space, get across some of the basics, like I mentioned, and, uh, you know, realise that everyone's got their own different projects that they'll try to sell you on. And if people aren't being honest with you about the trade-offs, you, you just shouldn't trust them. 
personally, uh, you know, if, if someone meets with me to talk about their project and I don't ask you technical questions or I don't ask to see your documentation, you should probably take that as a bad sign that you've actually failed to capture my attention. Um, you know, I think it's really important that we can, we can be honest now at this point in the cycle about, you know, what are the trade-offs? But, you know, the other thing to consider is if you're, if you're a business who's interested in this technology, um, it may not necessarily be incumbent on you to have to choose between all these protocols. Um, you know, you can, you can get advice and help from other people who can translate for you. So, uh, you know, we're, we're very much still in early days in this space. All right. Thank you, Chloe. Uh... Lots of questions come at me. Uh, John Pratt's gone a few times. John, over the chat offline. John, I like the way you're thinking. I like the fact you're pushing back on all these things. We should have this conversation. I'd encourage people to reach out to me on, on LinkedIn as well. I'm very grateful, Chloe, for the, uh, for the hour of the time. Hopefully, and it feels like we've stimulated the conversation. There are still um, 295 people online. We've lost about 10 in the last minute or two. Um, 300 people showing up is a, is a pretty extraordinary effort. And I think we've probably, we've obviously seen a few come and go, but uh, thank you, Chloe. Uh, I'll hand back to, to John. Thanks, uh, Swinburne, for giving us the opportunity to, uh, to sort of clear our throats in relation to a lot of this subject matter. Thanks, Steve. Look, thank you both. Uh, that was amazing. Um, so much content covered in such a short period of time. Uh, look, both of these people, I'm talking to the audience now, are incredibly helpful and available. Um, I encourage you to reach out. Uh, and look, just I'm, I'm just going to leave it there. Um, please contact us if you want any additional information or help. We will put this up on our website in a couple of weeks. We, we actually have to put, you know, put a, a text um, line in, in the video. Um, so it just takes a couple of weeks, but it will be up if people uh, want to want to review some of it. Thanks a lot and good night. Thank you, everyone.